What's up, everybody? Welcome to another episode of the Brutally Speaking Podcast, the official podcast of MetalNexus.net, where you can get all your show reviews, concert reviews, concert photos, this podcast, and so much more. And with me, as always, is Daniel Terry. How are you doing this evening? I'm doing fantastic. As a matter of fact, I'm super excited that I did not have to shout over people at a concert to do interviews. That's right. Uh, This is going to be an interesting episode. This is going to be... This is five interviews that I did uh, at Sonic Temple Festival. Uh, they are all, they are about 10 minutes. Um, but it is with Manuel from Zill and Arter, Joel from Killswitch Engage, Griffin and Ryan from Shapes, Britt from Wage War, and Kyle from Bad Wolves. Uh, I think all of these interviews, I, would, I don't even know if you can call them interviews. Honestly, they, these are just such fly by the seat of your pants kind of chats. Uh, and as you'll hear, there's a lot of background noise. Uh, I tried to edit it as best I could, but there's just, when you are in a tent full of media from all over the world, uh, doing press all at the same time, you're just kind of at the mercy of whatever you have. Thankfully, this podcast is, uh, I think you guys are used to the fact that, uh, sometimes we have to deal with, uh, background noises and so forth. So shouldn't be anything normal for you if you're a long time listener of this podcast. So, uh, was pirate rock radio there? I think so, actually. Oh, really? From Sweden? Uh, There was something rock radio. Well, I'm sure. <laughs> there was somebody actually behind me during an interview with... I don't even remember who it was with. I just remember hearing the band say their band name three times in a matter of about 30 seconds. And I was like... I turned around and I caught eyes with whoever... Somebody in the band. I don't remember who it was. And they just kind of shot me this look like, Jesus Christ. And then I kind of put two and two together that they didn't know apparently who they were talking to. And I was like, oh, no. <laughs> I mean, granted, like, I, the, the interview... Meshuggah. The band is called Meshuggah. I mean, that's like when, uh, speaking of, when I was sitting there waiting for one interview, and they were like, a publicist comes by, and they're like, would you like to talk to someone from Bad Wolves? And I was like, uh, sure. And, like, I thought I'd have, like, you know, maybe five, ten minutes to prep for that, at least. And they're like, okay, here's Kyle. And I'm like, oh, uh, okay, here we go. <laughs> can I, can I give Kyle some trouble for a minute? Sure. Okay. Um. Did Did you get the impression that Kyle's never actually seen a Predator movie? Yeah, kinda. Yeah, I kind of got that impression because you're like, "Oh, tell me what you think about that franchise. It's a really cool shirt." And he's like, "Shout out to my to my friend that gives me all these cool shirts," and then just change the subject. <laughs> yeah. And I was like, "That dude's never seen a Predator movie before." Is that any different than the Kardashians wearing you know like death metal shirts? I uh. I don't know, because maybe at least Kanye might hit them with uh, samples that he might be using for something. I don't know. Oh, that's very true. I'm just giving him a little bit of trouble, but <laughs> that just really stood out to me as hilarious. No, it was really funny, though, because, uh, I mean, that's the thing. Um, you know, I was kind of texting Dan throughout the day, because, you know, he would be like, oh, how's, how's the festival? And I'm like, well, I'm in an air-conditioned tent, and that's pretty tight. Um, however... Almost every interview I was supposed to do, like if I had a scheduled time with somebody, typically it never happened when it was supposed to. So, like, <laughs> I got to go see Gojira, you know, the guitar player, burn his face. I saw that. But then I hurried up and beelined back to the media area so I could be there for my interview. That didn't end up happening. <laughs> And then as a result, I waited for like 45 minutes and I was like, okay, maybe some of these other press outlets are a little more, you know, important than me. So like, you know, I get it. It's fine. I'm just gonna sit here and, and wait my turn. And, and in turn, maybe somebody cool will come by and, you know, I'll chat with them real quickly. And then like an hour went by and, and the publicist came by and they're like, oh, so, uh, you know, asked me a question. I was like, oh, am I not interviewing so-and-so? And they're like, oh shit, I fucked up. And I was like, it's fine. And then secretly inside, I was like, oh, I didn't get to see the rest of Gojira, and now I missed Architects. <laughs> Bummer. Yeah, that sucks. So, I mean, that's, that is the flip side of, uh, of the festival, because Dan was like, oh, did you get to see this band? Did you get to see this band? Did you get to see this band? I did get to see quite a bit of performances, but, I mean, a lot of it was, okay, I can go all the way to the farthest side of the, the – the festival grounds i can catch a little bit of this band run inside through the stadium get back to the media area quickly do my 10 you know do a little bit of prep do my 10 minute you know conversation then i'll go find my wife at like the the stage right outside of the media area catch that band for a couple minutes i mean it's almost like a glorified warp tour but instead of having like 17 stages you just have three that are all like uh in a linear line of each other so it's like you get to see a little bit of everything and, I mean, it was a lot of fun. I, I thoroughly enjoyed the, the thing. I will definitely say I think that is where having two people <laughs> would come in handy so at least someone can Wink, wink, there. nudge, nudge. Yeah, where somebody can, uh, you know. You know uh, me, dude. I would just disappear with, like, a 24-pack 
and uh, you wouldn't see me for the rest of the festival. I was going to say, I guess it wouldn't have been any different. Dan would have been like, oh, my God, did you see Gojira? They were great. How about this band? Did you see these guys? Oh, man, Mashuga was great. And I'd be like, yeah, I, I guess. I, <laughs> I didn't do these interviews. I have weird – dude, it's it's hard for me to talk to other people about music in real life, though, because they'd be like, oh, have you ever heard of this band? And I'm like, yeah, the second and third album were pretty good. The fourth one was not that great. The fifth one was terrible. You know, <laughs> so on and so forth. Yes, I've heard of the band. <laughs> <laughs> but I think the fun thing about this, you know, kind of speaking to the the diversity that is like all the small interviews that I got to do. I mean, I personally kind of think some of these were a little hit, hit or miss because, you know, we'll as you'll hear with the one from Manuel with from Zeal and Arter, I was trying to initially act like, and I even said it, I'm trying to act like we're 20 minutes into like a, a you know 30 40 minute long conversation like where we've been talking for a while, and I realized very quickly, especially at you know 10 o'clock in the morning, the first day of a festival. That's not really what's going to happen. <laughs> uh, it's supposed to kind of be very loose and just fun chat. Uh, so then from that point on, I, I kind of learned to – like more like the Kyle one, just kind of go with the vibe. Um, the one that was kind of interesting and kind of thrown in my lap last second too was uh, Griffin and Ryan from uh, Shapes. You know, I had seen them play acoustically earlier about an hour before our interview. And then, you know, a lot of people I, I had heard uh, making the comment about Griffin's dad, uh, which is Bruce Dickinson of Iron Maiden. And I kept hearing everyone talk about, like, oh, what's it like growing up, you know, and, and with your dad and your dad and your dad and your dad. And the only thing – and I had no, I didn't even want to mention Bruce at all. But then I decided, because I had just seen him put out a press release about this uh, Saki-infused lager, I was like, okay, well, I'm going to ask him about that because <laughs> that's more on brand with what we do. Right. And then it seemed like at that point, like, you know, both the guys like just really opened up, you know, talking about drinking and you know, losing wallets and shit. Well, speaking of uh, of Zeal and Arger real quick, uh, it's weird that, that he would be tired, though, because according to one of your other interviews, I mean, all they do is stretch. <laughs> yeah, that was the shapes one. <laughs> yeah, they just get in there and just do their stretches. And, and so, I mean, he should have been he should have been wide awake and on top of it. Yeah, that was definitely a band I was looking forward to seeing, and I wasn't sure how the crowd was going to react to it because it's a little left to center. Uh, but I was pleasantly surprised to see, you know, a lot of. I mean, that was the thing. Kind of anyone who played that I thought was going to not have as good of a crowd as they were due to some of the competing bands that they were up against, uh, or the time slots they were up against. Pretty much everyone had a pretty good uh, crowd for everything. Uh, whether you were on one of the smaller stages at a kind of inopportune time or not, like everyone was being checked out and. Zealand Arter was definitely one of those bands the next day, and even later that day of them playing, a lot of people were like, yo, did you check out that band, Zealand Arter? Like, I can't explain it, but it's fucking weird and wild, and it was awesome. Right. Yeah, I'm sure for a lot of these guys, that was a new experience, but it's kind of, it's one of those, like, once you know, you're like, oh my god, music is so different now than I thought it was. <laughs> yeah, and that's like, I thought it was interesting, too, the fact that, you know, Kyle had made the comment about how most people had made the comments to them, looking forward to catching your set today, have never seen you. <laughs> Right, yeah. And I thought it was cool, actually, like some of the stuff that he said, uh, trying to be humble, and, you know, I, I appreciate that, but I'm also kind of like, no, dude, what you're doing is innovative, but he kept going on and on about, like, yeah, but I mean, other bands have done stuff like this before, better than me, you know, not necessarily musically, but just from the lyrical content, and uh, it's like, oh, come on, man, Get, you know, give yourself a little bit of credit, nobody's done it like you were doing it, you know? Right. Well, on that note, uh, we got a lot to dissect, a lot of mini uh, interviews, so let's get into the plethora of my Sonic Simple experience, and we'll talk to you guys afterwards. <laughs> So I have the pleasure of sitting with Kyle from Bad Wolves. Yo. How are you doing? This is your second time playing uh, Rock on the Range? We have Sonic actually Temple. never played uh, Rock on the Range uh, before. I've never played Rock on the Range with any band. I don't think any of – maybe Doc and John have played Rock on the Range, but I have not. What is the band that you're looking forward to on a thing like this? I know you're probably not here for the whole festival, but who are you looking forward to seeing, uh, at least on today? Um, I've had the, the pleasure of – on a few different festivals over the years of uh, sharing the stage with Mashuga, and I see that they are a few bands after us tonight, so I'm definitely looking forward to seeing them. 
They're definitely one of my favorite live bands. Just They're just so punishing live. I remember seeing them open for Tool on the Lateralis tour. Oh, yeah. And I hated it. Really? Well, at the time, to be fair. What album was out? Was that, that would have been the... Uh, Chaos whatever had, no, uh Yeah, is that the one that had New Millennium, Sinai Christ on it? Yeah. Okay, so yeah, that record. Yeah. And they were playing... But I mean, the thing that like a lot of people don't realize is at that point... Uh, arenas weren't really equipped and, and there really wasn't the technology to have the eight string guitars sound as good as they can now yeah I think well the eight string guitar technology the the low the, you know the extended range Jesus boys what's going on um, the the extended range guitar technology has really come a long way in the past 10 years as someone who has kind of already always been in the uh, extended range uh, air quotes on that one. Oh, yeah, there's a little GoPro on me. You can see it. Um, the first eight strings that, uh, that they were playing, I can't remember what company it was, but they were kind of like primitive. Yeah. Well, I think at that point, Meshuggah was making their own at that point. There was a Swedish guitar maker. I can't remember the name uh, for the life of me right now, but uh, yeah, within the past 10 years, it's really... You know, I mean, because I, I play like five string fan fret basses and shit, so I'm all I'm I'm in the whole uh, extended range because Doc and Chris tune tune their guitars down to G. So, but yeah, that that whole technology has really come a long way in a short amount of time. Because like I said, those early guitars they were using around that time were very primitive. They were almost just like blocks of wood with strings on them, and then now they're all fancy fan fret, crazy paint jobs. Well, it's been crazy. Like th thinking back to that, though, is like, see, like I haven't seen Mashuga since then. Yeah. But I've seen like you know the live DVD and stuff like that, and it's just like just hearing the quality of how you can actually hear all the kick drums. Yeah. You can hear all the guitar parts. Everything sounds good, and it's like, well, now I'm excited to see them because it's not going to sound like muddled shit. Yeah. You know exactly. But I mean, their uh, their front of house guy is is really great too. And he just knows where everything everything fits, and you know they, they've had Per uh, Per Nelson from Scar uh, uh, Scar Symmetry uh, playing with them for a while, filling in for uh, Frederick Thorndall, um, and he's just a perfect mix. Like he's a he's a, like if anybody were to f step into Frederick's shoes, I really think that uh, uh, that pair is probably the best fit, especially with his random unrehearsed solos that he likes to do over the Meshuggah stuff. Right. Um, do you? It's kind of weird because, like, looking at this lineup, it's like you know. <laughs> I know the the whole has the success. Obviously, like I remember doing an episode with Doc a while ago, like when Zombie had just gone number one. Yeah. And I was like, you know, I'm probably never going to talk to anyone who has a current number one hit. So what the fuck is it like? And he kind of was like, it kind of has. How you doing, man? Interrupting. In interrupting coil. You're the Andre Iguodala right now of my interview. <laughs> <laughs> um. But it's one of those things that it's kind of interesting to see how fast of the success that you guys have had. And the thing that I love about it as a fan of music where a lot of people are like, oh, yeah, well, it's just because of the cover. Because we've kind of become ensconced in this cover culture where, like, look at a band like I Prevail. They put out a cover, but they had a good record after it to, like, also go with it. And I feel like that's something that a lot of other bands aren't doing is they want to make the success off the cover but then have no real good quality after that content and I feel like you guys had a really great with Disobey like had something great coming right behind it and that's really what the fans are latching on to is it was the Trojan horse of sorts like it's like here's this song but we're a great fucking band who has great material beside this yeah well I mean I didn't even hear the zombie cover until like I was in the band for a year so we like that wasn't anything that was on the table when I had first joined the first song um, actually, I've, I've probably told this story a couple times, but maybe not to your listeners. Uh, so how I joined the band was, so I was in a different band, and we had kind of started slowing down. I called Doc, as I do, just because I've known Doc for, you know, 12 or 13 years now. And uh, I was just like, hey, man, you know anybody's just looking for a bass player? And he's like, hang on one second. And he puts the phone down, I hear some talking in the background. Picks up and goes, do you want me to music video? And I was like... <laughs> Yeah, sure. He's like, all right, I'll send you the song. Be at this address in downtown LA. And I was like, okay, cool. And that was the video for Learn to Live. Right. Yep. So I, I got all the, the heavier material First. before even like the songs that are on the radio now, like uh, Remember When, Hear Me Now, and Zombie. So I was like, oh, this is really good. This is a really good record. Right. 
And then we added the radio songs, and I was just like, oh, well, it's kind of like a little bit for everybody. You know, there's some brutality, but, you know, and, and then some songs to make the young girls cry, you know? Something, I mean, for those who can maybe see right now, uh, if you're watching the video, you're wearing a Predator t-shirt. <laughs> How do you feel about the Predator franchise and what they've done with it? First of all, I just want to shout out my friend Eric D. and Meth Syndicate, at Meth Syndicate. He supplies all my awesome t-shirts like this. Um, do you know what? I have, I have been terrible at going to the movies lately. I've been so I've been I, the last movie I saw in the theaters. I don't know. It's probably Deadpool two. All right. Well, I mean, shit. That's not. It's not that long ago. But I mean, when you're inundated with like Infinity War and Endgame and I mean, like I have not seen Endgame. Yeah, I've seen it twice. So I made up for you. Okay. So they got my you know forty dollars to go to the billion. Pot. There's another movie I haven't seen that came out that I wanted to see, and I forgot. See, this is why I forget shit all the time, so I don't even know what's out right now. I honestly, other than in Endgame, I really could Oh, shit, John Wick came out today. Oh, shit. Nice. I didn't realize. I oh, was like, the new Rammstein came out today, too. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I'm still not used to things coming out on Friday. Yeah, I was used to it Tuesday. Yeah, it's weird. CDs coming out on Tuesday, you go to the record store on Tuesday or Wednesday, you go pick it up. Yeah. But now with the uh, streaming culture, I guess it makes more sense. Like, you get the new album for the party this weekend. <laughs> Speaking of that, uh, you know, obviously with Doc kind of being able to give a, an update of what's going on with Bad Wolves via his podcast, asking you, uh, I know obviously you guys have been working on the follow-up record. Yeah. Uh, it would be safe to assume it will be out probably in fallish time? Uh, I don't know. We're, it's last quarter, maybe first quarter next year. I'm not really sure quite yet. Um, John just went and recorded drums in Nashville with Mark Lewis. Okay. Uh which he did the uh, the drums on the last record, so they'll sound awesome as always. Um, and uh, Tommy and John have been uh, in a studio in LA. I forget the name. I'm very terrible at this. I'm sorry. Um, but yeah, so it's uh, it should be out within that time frame. I'm not, I'm not exactly sure, but it's pretty pretty much in the can. Awesome. Well, thank you for taking the time, and uh, very much looking forward to actually finally catching your guys' set this for you know, the first time. Like, I heard that like the third time today. Like everyone's like, "Oh man, I wanted to see you, but I haven't been able to see you." I'm like, well, you guys always play me. like in fucking Detroit, or like I'm, I live in Michigan, so it's like you haven't come to Grand Rapids proper yet. And then when you did, it was that arena tour, and I just with a uh, death punch. It was five finger death punch, Breaking Benjamin, and uh, from Ashes to New, because I played, I played bass for, for from Ashes to New does not have a bass player. So I told him for our last show that we did with them, that was the last show, I was like, I'm going to play bass for you guys. It would be interesting. I think it would add a little bit more to their live sound, personally. Yeah. But looking forward to catching the set, and hopefully we'll see you uh, at least in uh, Grand Rapids at some yeah, point. For sure, dude. Awesome. Thank you very much. All right. So I have the pleasure of uh, talking with Joel from Kill Switch Engage, but more importantly today, he is from Brothers Born. <laughs> That's um, awesome. It's been, shit, three years, four years almost yeah. since uh, Knife Wounds came out. Yep. I hear through the grapevine, i.e. your brother, uh, a new one's coming out soon. Yes, it's almost done. Uh, we had to pump the brakes a little bit. Our, <laughs> our, uh, the other guy in the band, Mike, uh, just had his first his first little one. So, uh, yeah, we're just going to take a little time, let, let him be dad for a while. What, uh, you know, because there wasn't really a whole lot of press, unfortunately, around the release of Knife Wounds. Yep. So what kind of inspired the, the beginning of the band, the project? Uh, honestly, man, it was just really me and Mike hanging out. Like uh, he was friends with my wife. She bartended at a bar down the street, and uh, it's like, hey, you guys should chat. We started hanging out, having beers together, and uh, I think he had asked me if I could uh, demo a song, for, like you know, record a demo for him. Uh, so we did that at the house, and then I was like, hey, I got a song you should sing on, and, and that was it. And we started writing songs together. Do you kind of look to something? I mean, because the interesting thing is, is like you know. I don't think fans of Killswitch would be drastically shocked to see you do something in this vein with the kind of interludes that you kind of fool around with on all the Killswitch records that have been omnipresent on every single one. Yep. But what does Brothers Born scratch the itch of creatively for you that maybe Killswitch doesn't since you kind of dip into that a little bit? I think it just kind of, it's, it's a nice outlet for me to play all the styles of music I like that aren't metal, you know? Just acoustic stuff, there's, there's kind of like some classic rock stuff, there's a little bit of 80s vibe to it. Having just seen Mark play over at the Zippo Sessions and him putting out a solo record, which is a little bit... It's not so much that it's not 
Mark Morton. Like you wouldn't be like, wow, I never saw this side of him coming with the solo record. But having seen him kind of play more acoustically, where it feels like what I think is more in Mark's wheelhouse of if you were to go hang out with him and what he wants to play, more sitting with an acoustic literally in his lap and just kind of jamming. Would you like to do something more like that at some of these events and kind of do a Brothers Born thing in that capacity and kind of showcase it a little bit more than what you've gotten yeah, to? possibly at some point. I mean, they said Mike and I, you know, we obviously both travel for work. You know, you, you used to... Uh, Work for AMCI, you travel for all the, you know, do car car events and stuff like that. So a lot of times when I was home, he was gone and vice versa. So that's part of the reason it's taken us so long to to make this next record. We just weren't like there was a good year and a half where we just weren't home at the same times. Um, but it would be fun. It'd be fun to do some shows. I was going to say I I do know that you have like a home studio and you record bands and so forth with kind of the less intensive writing schedule or process it would take to record a Brothers Born song. Are you constantly writing stuff even when on the road, like just jamming out, or do you kind of like to separate that from when you're on the road and just kind of do that when the time is right and working together? I think we kind of just do it when the time is right. There's, there's never been any kind of like schedule for us to, hey, we're going to sit down and write today. Or just like, it's always just about hanging out, you know, hanging in my basement, smoking and drinking or something, <laughs> and strumming a few chords, like, hey, I got this part that can go after that. And it always, it, it's usually pretty, happens pretty naturally, I think. I was going to say, I was pleasantly surprised when... Tyler was talking about how you guys were starting this project. I honestly thought it was you and Tyler doing something. A lot hence of people the name that. of Brothers Born. A lot of people say, "Hey, how's your brother from Brothers Born?" Like it's not, like it's not actually my brother. He might as well be at this point. But, right. You know. Has there ever been thoughts of having integrating Tyler into it? Yeah, uh, we talked about that because we have we have kind of a like a rotating band sort of. We have a bunch of friends that play with us. You know, Mike and I have done acoustic shows, just the two of us. We have a bunch of guys that kind of, you know, pop in. Whoever's around will play, at, you know, bass, drums, additional guitar. So I think Tyler would fit the bill for bass and guitar. I've talked to him about that before. So I was going to say, I know you guys, I know you have filled in for City of Homes a couple of times. Yeah, and yeah. Tyler has filled in for Kill Switch. Yeah. And it's funny to see you both playing because it's like you have a very similar style between the playing, the, the presentation of playing on stage yeah. and so forth. <laughs> Uh, so it's one of those that seems like it should just naturally happen at some point to... It's funny, man. My, my parents came out to that City Home show where I filled it on bass. My mom took a video, and it's just hilarious looking at the two of them. <laughs> it's like the same person standing More next to each other. Yeah, yeah it's um, hilarious. It's funny, he ruined he ruined a part of one of the Kill Switch songs for me. He told me that on uh, was it Arms of Sorrow, that Adam D's part in that was actually supposed to be Valos. And it just was didn't it? work out scheduling-wise. And I think it was that song. Uh, and ever since then, he's always, like, after he told me that, I was like, I can't not hear potentially, like, a big, like, hymn chorus on that, from that <laughs> I'm spot. I'm not sure I ever knew that was supposed to happen. Oh, he was he told me that you were the one who t- told him that. <laughs> well, maybe he's talking out of his ass, that yeah, I don't know. Who knows? Who knows? <laughs> um, you know, kind of speaking to, not necessarily the new Kill Switch record, but is it interesting to, to find... Kill Switch fans kind of at the Brothers Born show. Do, do you find that they are there solely because it's it's you from Kill Switch, or do you tend to find that people are actually coming out really enjoying what Brothers Born is doing and supporting that? You know, I've really found on, the, on the, the few shows we've done, it really seems like it's kind of its own thing. Yeah. Because like, it's not. I mean, I think there's you know a handful of Kill Switch fans that might might dig it, but it's definitely a, a pretty big departure. So it's sort of a separate thing, man. It's, it is. It's funny because I remember going to see uh, The Damn Things, if you are familiar with them at all. And so that's one of Keith's like bigger side projects. But he had another one before that called uh, Finale. And it was more of a, an acoustic folk kind of thing. And I remember going to Detroit to go see him play. And there was like yeah, maybe 15 of us there. Clearly, everyone was an Every Time I Die fan. But the weird thing was, is like everyone didn't know any of the material. They were just kind of standing there, arms crossed, like all wearing Every Time I Die shirts, and it was very weird to be the only pseudo-fan of that band, like, where I knew all the lyrics to stuff being played, and I was like, it's cool you're all here, but you're not, it doesn't seem like, it seems like you you as the artist have to traverse and tree train people to be like, it's really awesome you're here as a Kill Switch fan, but this really isn't Kill Switch. Yeah, I'm sure, I, I think when our uh, Knife Woods came out, there were probably a few people scratching their heads a little bit when they heard it, like, Oh, it's this. This is not what I expected. You you know, maybe that's good for some people, maybe not for others. 
Well, I was going to say, do you look at someone maybe like a Dallas Green who kind of came from City and Color, or I mean, from Alexis on Fire and then has had a really successful solo career at City and Color and kind of just musically what he's kind of taken that, that project and done with it. Do you kind of look at something like that and go like, oh, I, I feel like maybe it starts off as this thing and maybe we kind of grow it into its own thing. Is that something you would like to do or do you really want to keep it very kind of compact and niche? It's really hard to say. I think at this point we're just really, really slowly making this record that we're very proud of. You know, it's, we've been working on it for over a year now. Um, so there's really not much to be done. It needs to, you know, a few guitar tracks, a few vocals, it needs, a, it needs a mix and a master, and then we're kind of there. But I don't really think we have any plans to try to take over the world or anything. We just want to write good music that we like and do some fun shows here and there when we can. And, you know, what, uh, when, when life here. doesn't get in the way, you know. <laughs> <laughs> kind of switching up gears, I know uh, you guys put out uh, with, uh, I think it was Cigar Boat Brewing, put out the Kill Switch beer. Oh, Cigar City, yeah. There's Cigar City, yes, yep. I'm sorry. Yep. Uh, These guys are awesome. So obviously we the name of ours is brew brutally speaking BREW, so we like to dip into that a little bit. Is there any collaboration in the works to do something again, another run since that beer seemed to do so well with you guys? We haven't talked about it uh, recently, but yeah, that beer was fantastic. You guys did a really great job with it. It was a pretty high octane uh, IPA kind of beer, really, really good. Is that much I was trying to think of the last time we hung out back in GR, what I think I asked you what was your go-to beer, if it was like IPA, stouts, porters, whatever, and I think you kind of said you were more like a, just a, an IPA, but like you like a little bit of everything depending on your mood. Yeah, I like, kind of like, I've, I've kind of changed a little bit over the years. I, I kind of, other than Guinness, I don't really drink a lot of stouts anymore. I love Guinness though, I drink it all the time. That's usually my go-to beer. And are you still big on to like whiskey, spirits, and all that kind of stuff? Not so much, beer? not yeah. so much. I knew you were a big, what, maker's guy or beam? You still like beam? I uh, like Canadian club still. I drink that, but it's, you know, in moderation now. I'm getting too old to be pounding whiskey all the time, but. Yeah, yeah. But uh, I, I, do, I do enjoy it very much. What, uh, in your travels, what's kind of been, you know, because I feel like you're in a unique position to kind of really get a, a spectrum of what the craft beer boom has kind of done, either uh -huh. here in the States or even abroad. What has been something. Do you feel like the the bubble has been burst? And if not, what where do you kind of see the? What are some of the breweries you think are kind of really hitting it out of the park with everything they're doing? Uh, let's see. Well, it's funny. There's one in East Hampton, my hometown, uh, Fort Hill Brewery, that's doing great stuff. An abandoned building. They have like a few really awesome breweries just right near where I live. It's great. And it's nice to see some of those uh, awesome IPAs popping up on the East Coast. It's just kind of been a big thing, you know, in the, the West Coast for years with you know Stone and uh, Lagunitas and. Um, a lot of great breweries out there, so it's, it's sort of finding its way over to the East Coast now, which is awesome to see. It's been kind of crazy to see the uh, New England IPA style starting to make its way. Yeah. Like having gone over to Rhode Island and having never heard of a New England style and trying and be like, this is pretty good. Yeah. And then it seems like ever since that trip, I've been seeing everyone starting to do their take on a New England IPA. And so it's kind of interesting to see, very much like with music, regional places putting their stamp on on various types of beer you know I'm, I'm very fortunate to live in michigan and at grand rapids especially with founders and bells kind of basically being uh, founders is fantastic yeah. and now that they have their own like uh a second brewing to do kind of like the one-offs we're just inundated with a lot of specialty one-offs that you're just like i love it bells is the two-hearted ale right that is correct that's killer that's a great beer i had seen a billboard in my travels that said that two-hearted is the number one drank beer in america really I don't know if I believe it. I'm not sure I believe it, but it's fantastic beer. Maybe the one number one craft got, or craft beer, because I mean, and then like every show I go to now, and I look around, and everyone's drinking it too hard. And I'm like, you know, maybe it's like the it's like the Bud Light of craft beer at venues. It seems. <laughs> yeah, Michigan's a, a fantastic beer state, man. It really is. Do you get a lot of it? I would assume the distribution for for Bells and and Founders at least is gets down to you. Yeah, for sure. What uh. What is kind of your go-to beer, you know, when you're out and about, if you can get a craft beer anywhere, what is it? It depends. Honestly, uh, if, if we're hanging out, you know, I really like the LDA IPA. The Founders is great. We usually have those on the bus because it's, it's pretty low gravity and it tastes great. Uh, when I'm at home, I really like the Fort Hill. They do one called the uh, Farmer's Tyler Farm. Tyler What's that? Doesn't Tyler work there? Tyler works at Tinbridge. Those guys are coming yeah. up. Those, they're making awesome beer, too. Those guys are really kind of... Only about a year and a half old, I think, yeah. at this point. The beers are fantastic. I forgot to mention those guys. They're, they're great dudes. They photos of beers, and I'm like, yeah. where's that from? And he goes, oh, where I work. And I go, can you send me some? It sounds great. Yeah, fantastic people there and really, really good beer. What, uh, 
other than the new Brothers Born record, the upcoming Killswitch record, what are you looking forward to for the rest of this this year? And uh, who are you looking forward to seeing tonight? Honestly, uh, as far as the, the new Killswitch, I think we're all just really excited to get it out. It's, it's done. We turned it in. We don't have a release date yet, but we should have one soon. I thought I per the internet, I thought it was like August something. I think that's what we're hoping for. Okay. But we don't have it, so we haven't confirmed the release date, so it should. Probably got to wait on vinyl and. And yeah, all of I think those kind of I things think that's the big place. thing. They want to do vinyl at the same time, so we're just kind of waiting to get all that together. We should probably know very soon the exact date, but uh, we were hoping for, we were hoping for the summertime initially. So we'll see if we can do that. <laughs> and then, who are you looking forward to seeing uh, tonight? Ah, uh, it's hard. To, there's a lot of people. Looking forward to seeing Lamb of God. I haven't seen those guys in a while. Uh, Coach Ira, love those guys. Uh, beyond that, I'm not even sure who's playing. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I know Josh was telling me you guys are basically all heading out pretty early in the morning. Yeah, yeah. So I didn't know if you guys were like kind of beelining it. It's going to be kind of an early night for us. Yeah, we're getting, you know, <laughs> still got to pack up our things. So the, yeah, the, the tour of Parkway Drive just, just wrapped up the other day. And so this is, this is the last one for us. And then we're home for a little while. Awesome. Well, thank you for taking the time and uh, looking forward to seeing your set tonight. And uh, hey, you, I know you're not going to play anything new, I don't think. Not just yet. Not just yet. Next tour. Next door. And, uh, so looking forward to it. Thank you for taking the time. You got it, brother. Thank you. All right, well, I feel like as we as men are not even allowed to really have an opinion anyway. Uh, so I have the pleasure of sitting uh, with Brenton and Seth of Wage War. How are you two doing today? Good. How are you? Doing, uh, I'm doing good. It's, uh, it's been a very hot day here already. I've been melting, and thankfully they fixed the AC that I'm right next oh, to. You. I'm feeling good now. I, I like this spot. You got a good spot. <laughs> you guys can, uh, if you want to move over, you can. Oh, I'm good. Thank you, though. And uh, so... Kind of jumping right into it, because I usually like to do long-form interviews, so I'm going to act like I've been talking to you for about 15, 20 minutes already. There you go. <laughs> um, Deadweight seems to have kind of propelled the band to newer heights, more so than where Blueprints kind of had left off, um, which, I mean, I feel like Blueprints really set the bar pretty high for you guys. Um, so have you been surprised at the legs Deadweight has had, you know, almost uh, over a year now at this point, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, I, I think Blueprints set us up to just, like, say, hey, we're out here. Uh, Dead Weight, I feel like we wrote just way better songs, you know, w way better, well-rounded album. And um, I think I feel like we had something really to say through that record, and I think a lot of people relate. Yeah, absolutely. And like you said, that album's been out, I think, this August it will have been out for two years. Do something different. Just switch your mics. Yours is uh, kind of on the quieter end for whatever reason. Okay. Jacked up. So no one gives a fuck about what I'm saying. Go ahead and say that again. Um... Yeah, and like you said, uh, our album Deadweight has been out for about two years this August. So, uh, yeah, I mean, we've been touring off that for a long time. And as you know, we put out our new single, Low, earlier this year. So we're excited with the, the follow-up for that and to uh, show, show everybody what we've been working on. Well, I can see how much of a pro you already are because that is the follow-up question I had, which is, you know, you did drop Low in January. And would you say that's it? Because I, I, what's kind of interesting and something I'm kind of a stickler for on this podcast is talking about EPs versus follow, or versus full lengths, singles, you know, kind of comparing the rock culture to what, like, the hip-hop culture is kind of doing with mixtapes and so forth. Do you feel that dropping a single so far ago without having, like, here is plans for the record, here's pre-orders, here's or another single coming, do you feel like that... Actually, here's a really great example of what I'm why I'm asking this. Yeah. So Slipknot put out All Out Life. That's not going to be on the record, apparently, that they're dropping, which is the name of the record. But apparently, so, like, that's just a single. So in the event of, like, now they've dropped another song, then now the rollout for the yeah. record and so forth. I, I do think with streaming, though, like, everyone has it already. So I, I understand what you're saying. Yeah. Like, it should be on the record. But anyway, um, we did drop low for people to chew on for a little bit, and I can confirm there's a record number three that's done. So is, is low... When choosing that as a song, yeah. is that in the indicative of kind of where the rest of the record is going to go? Or, I mean, because like with um, the band, you've kind of traversed yeah, a lot of styles. I mean, that's a little hard to just like base the record off one song. Um, I, I think Lowe's more of a uh, more of a wage war kind of jam. Um, I, on the record, there's more stuff that people have never heard that side of us. So, yeah. Um, it's going to be cool. I think it's going to be really cool. It, yeah, like you said, I mean, we've got kind of a lot of different styles that we have done. I mean, anything from Stitch and the River to the acoustic versions of Johnny Cash and Gravity. And 
and you know it's kind of a risk putting those out but everybody seems to like it and you know and Britain was singing on that and stuff and that's cool and you know low I think is a good representation of both sides of our band it's got you know the heavy parts it's got a breakdown it's got the riffs uh, but it also has that really melodic chorus and kind of shows off Cody's singing as well so you know I think a lot of our album is going to be you know that classic wage war sound that's a combination of both and then maybe we'll show uh show the world a new side of wage war too and we're excited about that you know kind of speaking to the stripped down versions was it like i'm sure obviously you're not gonna put out something that you don't feel strongly about were you a bit trepidatious in releasing them and wondering how the fans were going to kind of react to that since it was kind of a newer style that you're introducing now maybe a little bit but um you know if you like our music, you like our music. Even if we put one song out you might not like. Uh, it was something we wanted to do, you know. And um, I don't know. Yeah, so. and, it, and we had already put out Gravity, which was already, you know, an all-singing song. Um, so stripping down that, it really just made it like a more chilled-out vibe. It wasn't like, oh, this is a totally new song now, you know. So it, it's it's cool, you know. We got to we got to put out a new side of our band, and, like, people really seem to latch on to it. That uh, Johnny Cash video and even the Gravity, like, those songs both seem to have been getting a lot of attention, which made us feel good because, you know, like, we can do different things and different styles while still remaining, you know, wage war, and people are okay with it, and they seem to like it. And I, I think that's a big thing with metal, too. Um, there's just, you can't be going hard in all the time. I mean, I Don't mean, tell them the sugar that. Well. <laughs> and they do it very well. <laughs> True, but I mean, you can have like your kill switch, Lamb of God, things. They slow it down a little bit, you know. I mean, it's not about going hard all the time. It's that's why music is emotion, you know. You hit those highs, you hit the lows, whatever. You know, you kind of with doing a, a reimagined version of a song that already exists in one way, shape, or form. Do you have you found that fans were like, you know, I didn't really like that song initially, but upon you doing this, I've kind of been able to go back to the original and actually find more things about the original that I like that I, I didn't initially. Yeah, I think that's with all music. There's some uh, acoustic songs I've heard from other bands I'm just like, wow, you know? that Like, uh, the biggest example ever is uh, Johnny Cash Hurt. I'm like, that's a Nine Inch Nail song? And, and then you go back, listen, you're like, wow, you know? So. Yeah, and I think, like what you just said, I mean, there are people who have found out about our band because of the stripped down versions, oddly enough. You know, they've had maybe a, like a daughter, like a girl showed her mom, oh, listen to this band. Like, I love this band, but you might actually like this song. And it's a stripped down version. And like the moms are like, oh yeah, Wage War is cool. But that never happened before we put those songs. No mom thought Wage War was cool before that. <laughs> it's funny you say that because it reminds me of when I went and saw Trey on the Curse Tour because I, I am in my mid 30s, so like I'm kind of older than most of your demographic yeah, yeah. probably. But it, it's funny to remember seeing the parents coming along and when they did the Bon Jovi cover at that point, the parents being like, oh shit, one for me, I know yeah, this. Yeah, yeah. Yes, exactly. And so it's interesting to kind of definitely see that. Like, you know, I've been to plenty of shows for interviews and so forth, and you see the parents at the end of the bar with their like holding like yeah. the bundle of merch and all that kind of stuff, looking like they just could care less about being there. So it does kind of got to be cool to now sort of be becoming a multi-generational band, I guess. Yeah. Uh, what's cool about this fest, too, that we're playing at Sonic Temple, there's those people that are out here watching Meshuggah, you know? Like, dudes that are in their 50s. Like, like, like the older rockers. Yeah. Exactly. Like, there, there's, there's some real deals out here, you know? They're, they want to see everybody. Yeah, that that is definitely one of my favorite parts about playing these festivals is, you know, we can go on any, like, tour within our scene, even with bigger bands, you know, like of Mice and Men or the Day to Remember or August Burns Red, which have all been awesome. But then you come out to these festivals and like you said, I mean, there's like a ghost fan will watch. Yeah, there's you know? other other bigger bands headlining and like that pulls out so many fans that we would not normally be able to play in front of. So it really gives us an opportunity to, um, you know, put ourselves out there and hopefully make some new fans that like wouldn't have normally heard of us if we hadn't been on this festival and some of these other summer festivals we're doing. What has been one of the more surprising, I don't necessarily want to say visually, a fan that come up has come up to you where you're like, that person probably gives two shits less about our band, but has come up to you and been like, oh my god, I love your band. Um, dude, the uh, epicenter, literally after we played, like some of the security guards were like, what was that? That was awesome. Like, <laughs> we are just here to work and we were just rocking. I'm like, that's, that's, true. that's so sick. So we'll, we'll see you guys pop up on Blabbermouth, because after that DGD security guy who was just like looking at them being like yeah yeah they didn't look like they would care at all and on top of that like 
there were tons of crowd surfers and stuff kind yeah, of yeah. destroying them like during yeah. our set so i probably thought they would hate us but they came up to us afterwards they're like you guys were awesome man yeah it's cool it's funny to see like that security guards are now sort of becoming like their own uh like getting a resurgence in popularity yeah. or whatever like people are like starting to film them the reactions to them <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah i know i know does. chelsea grin got a really funny one during warp tour that was a, that was a good one. kind of speaking to the warp tour you guys are playing uh what a lot are saying is the last warp tour uh in talking with maddie mullins a little bit ago uh he was making the comment about how he thinks this is the last one in any iteration because then they'll have hit the 25 years be inducted into the rock and roll hall of fame as a longest standing uh, festival I mean, I mean, that's always been talked about, but I don't think Kevin's really come out and said that. Um, right. I, I do know the whole cross-country tour is over, but I think it could just stay a festival thing, which is pretty cool. What uh, What is it, you know, in being a destination face festival very much like this is, yeah. how does it feel being picked, you know, among, I mean, it kind of is like just a fucking stacked lineup of Warp Tour, who's who's past and present. It, it feels sick. It's an honor, you know, just to be out there with the guys who started it, you know. Yeah, true honor for sure. Absolutely. I mean, we've we've only gotten to do it two years, um, but we definitely feel like very thankful for those two years. And I honestly, I, I'm really sad that it's over because those two years were some of the yep. like biggest growing moments for our band. Um, just being on Warp Tour those two different summers, and I, I felt like we've seen the most growth probably of any tour from Warp Tour. Um, so we're sad to see it go. But again, as Britton said, like totally honored that they would choose us to play these festival dates and. And yeah, like you said, I mean, the, the 25 year anniversary, I could see it going both ways. You know, maybe they'll, maybe they will keep doing it just as a festival, or maybe he's just like, all right, I'm over it. You know, time to get inducted to the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. That would be sick either way. What, uh, do you, do you envision that there will be another, you know, because there's talks about bringing Mayhem back? Yeah. Uh, and stuff like that. And obviously, like, Summer Slaughter is a big, you know, touring festival. <laughs> Do you see something coming along that's more of a, an actual package touring festival like the All-Stars Tour used to be or something? Yeah. Um, do you think there's a demand for that still? I, I think so. I, I do. Um, I, it just it, the, the world's changing, you know. Um, I, I think these big festivals like this are, are really sick. There's a lot of people coming around the area. Um, the lineup has everything to do with it. Number one for me. Uh, if if it's not stacked, kids are not going to come out. You know, they're not going to spend forty dollars on a ticket to see one band. You know, so I think I think that's number one is the lineup. That's definitely number one. And number two is obviously you know how it's set up. Nobody wants a fire festival. I don't know if you yeah, saw that yeah. documentary, <laughs> but yeah, which I, is weird because now everyone's making faux fire festival yeah. shows. Gosh. Like we, there was one back in Grand Rapids. Uh, at like a rather large venue, like a Live Nation venue, and they were having like a cheese eating sandwich competition for uh, another festival that's happening in Grand Rapids in like in August. And I was like, it's funny that this thing is turned like something that was a monumental failure has turned into something that has become sort of a successful brand. Yeah. After weird. the fact. That's so weird. It's yeah. very weird. It's so weird. Like I think that speaks to the culture we live in now. Yeah, where, it's so weird. Like, I don't know. Like I said. At 35 years old now, I, I'm just, I'm amazed at everything and shocked by nothing at the same time. Yeah. Yeah. And meanwhile, that guy's like sitting in prison, you know, <laughs> like for, for that festival. But, but, <laughs> so uh, that's crazy. Yeah, but back to the touring circuit, I, I think it's possible for sure. I mean, these three dates of Sonic Temple are sold out. So the, the rockers and the metalheads are out here. So it's, it's just the lineup. I'm telling you. <laughs> what, uh, what is, obviously you probably can't really speak too much in, in detail at all, but what is the rest of 2019 all for you guys? Uh, definitely a new record and a lot of touring for sure um, I, I do know we have like like the Warp Tour I think um, a couple we're doing Slam Dunk in, yeah, uh, Slam in Europe, Dunk over so. in Europe coming back I Matter Fest yeah and then, just uh, a couple sprinkled through you know yeah and then take a little bit of time off through the, the hot summer months like June and July and then um, you don't want to be touring in the, the heat dead no, heat of summer no, <laughs> not really <laughs> that's like doing a Canadian run in the middle well, of winter yeah I live in yeah. Florida so it's really hot but um yeah, we'll be back at it in fall, I'm sure. Awesome. And uh, who are you most looking forward to seeing tonight? Oh, man. Meshuggah and Ghost, for sure. I was really looking forward to watching uh, them. You know what? Beartooth also, also. Those guys rock. Yeah, Beartooth, System of a Down. The bummer is I'm actually 
flying home as soon as we're done playing because I have a friend's wedding to go to tomorrow morning. Missing out. So I'm really blowing it right now, but uh, I'm happy that the other guys. Are you are doing? Here. Are you giving the? Are you? Like, are you the best man, or just one of the? Are you going to a wedding? No. Yeah. So Cody is actually in the wedding. I am just attending along with our merch guy. Uh, it's one of our good friends, and uh, yeah. So we, we're leaving like pretty much right after we leave. Uh, after we play, excuse me. I was gonna say, I think if you guys, if you were one of the best men, you would have to throw that in your best man speech. Like, by the way, yes, yeah, I gave up all of these bands for you. I know your wedding, your marriage better last. It's a pretty big deal. Yeah, don't mess this up. Yeah, exactly. if you're watching Christian, shout out. Sadly, that is not on. I turned it off to say battery. Oh, never mind. Well, you can we just hear our voices into a, into a camera that's turned off. Yeah. yeah. Uh, well, thank you again, and I'm very much looking Absolutely. forward to seeing you guys at set today. Thank Thanks you so much, man. Thanks, bro. Yeah. So I have the pleasure of sitting here with Manuel from Zealand Arter uh, here at the 2019, uh, I want to keep calling it Rock on the Range, but it is Sonic Temple Festival. Uh, you were the first interview, so you were kicking things off for us here. Um, I'm going to kind of just get right into it. I'm not going to throw softball questions out. I usually like to do long-form interviews, so I'm going to act like we've been talking for 15, 20 minutes already. Um, something, you know, I've kind of heard you say over the, a few interviews is that in your approach to writing music, it's not it's kind of the not giving a shit aspect of like overthinking, overanalyzing, and just kind of being present in whatever you're creating. And it kind of has made me wonder with the success of Devil Is Fine and now Stranger Fruit, do you worry that more expectation will change that approach? I think that's inevitable. I like to tell myself that I'm trying to, you know, forget what other people say, but I mean, as soon as you're creating something, you're gonna think about other people's opinions, if you like it or not. But I think, for me, the right thing to do is to kind of mute that out as far as possible and see where that takes me. Have you already started, I mean, I know Stranger Fruit hasn't been out, like, you know, it's not like two years old or anything, but in the day and age now of, like, everyone needing the next thing, do you, like, are you already kind of writing new stuff? Are you always writing and then kind of seeing where an album kind of is leading you, like, okay, I have, like, seven or eight songs, but really only three of these are really kind of connecting with me, and that's the new route where I think we're going to go on for a new record. Like, do you constantly write like that? That's pretty much it. I mean, I, as soon as I'm home, I always write because I don't have another life, and um, I just kind of see what sticks to the wall and maybe, you know, what actually might inspire other songs. But right now I'm still at the throwing shit at a wall stage. Yeah. So I... Something that I found interesting, and, and I wanted to broach the topic, but I didn't necessarily know how because it made made me feel a little nervous uh, given the context and the weight of everything, but I think that's kind of excites me because I think that leads to interesting conversations. Um, metal as a whole is kind of more of a predominantly like white subculture of between the musicians who play it, the, the fans that go to it, and so forth. And what's interesting to me is... There are numerous examples of those basically being our, our norms, um, but that you kind of yourself buck most of the norms in the music in the way that it's presented and you by playing it. Do you feel like you've had to overcome more obstacles? I think uh, pretty much the opposite is, is the, I mean, there's, there's something to be said about affirmative action and I think we've also profited of that because we are in a way a, a novelty or even a gimmick band if you know, if you want to be very uh, strict about it, and that has actually helped us. So I think in a in a in a perfect world, I wouldn't be playing here, because yeah. Well, it's one of those that like when I kind of was thinking about it, it's like you know, you know, talking to like a band like Hands Like Houses or like King Parrot or something like that, where it's like you know they're from Australia and they like, geographically have obstacles to overcome with getting visas and so forth. That I didn't know if like maybe that also attributed to some of the obstacles you would have to crossing over here to like American fans or fans in general that aren't maybe as adventurous as where you are and understanding of like just the crossing of many genres to create something new? Um, I think luckily thanks to the internet age and the internet pre oh buzzword, what the fuck is that? I have no idea, is it a <laughs> Is that a parrot? No, I, was, I was hoping to see an exotic bird then. That didn't happen. Not yet. Yeah, not yet. <laughs> I mean, we, we also have to like... Uh, get the visas, which is a pain in the butt, but um, I think the way music is consumed and shared is really um, helpful. People want, like the weird stuff. Right. Do you feel it not... I mean, it's kind of weird, because it's like, you know, I'm in my mid-30s, so like I remember the internet before it existed and the way that it does, where it has 
connect allowed us to connect to so much, but also been very diversive uh, in like, well, I only like these things, so I'm going to cater my social experiences to what I like, and anything else can just kind of get fucked. It's one of those that it makes me wonder if you not living in the States where everything kind of is like a trend, like, oh, here's the trend, follow this trend. Every band, you want to have a successful path, just whatever this thing is, carbon copy that, and hopefully you'll be better than most to rise to the, uh, to rise to the top. So it kind of makes me wonder if you even geographically feel like that's kind of giving you a different take on heavy music and the music you're making because you're not inundated maybe with all the bullshit we do here. It might have. I mean, I grew up uh, going to squat shows and like hardcore, crusty, gross stuff. And I mean, that is very much uh, I don't give a shit. Hey, Tying back in. Yeah. yeah. It's gross at times, but <laughs> I mean, it's doing what it wants to do. Something that I, I kind of have found interesting and I always... Themes are really interesting to me when uh, looking at music from a lyrical presentation to the visual representation of the music and how it's displayed. And what kind of struck me about your record, especially, you know, back with uh, Devil is Fine when I first heard that was, you know, you've made no bones that you kind of uh, deal with satanic imagery and, and some of the, the things associated with that. More of the, uh, I always mispronounce this, the, the Levanian, is that how you say it? Levan, okay, thank you. Um, but given the fact that you kind of also use like uh, African American spirituals and stuff like that, when I kind of was looking at everything from afar and kind of seeing like, okay, like what is Zealand Ardor? How does how do things? Because it doesn't seem like you do anything just haphazardly. It doesn't seem like it seems like everything's there for a reason. And maybe I'm overlooking. Uh, I, I try to do that as much as possible. But okay. Yeah. So like even in the name, something I kind of latched onto is the fact that the names basically mean almost the same thing. Uh, and it kind of made me wonder with kind of the juxtaposition of the two, the duality of the two genres you're kind of mixing along with a lot of everything else, if maybe you're kind of saying as a whole that there's more parallels between these two that most people probably wouldn't assume. Yeah, I think that's also what attracted me to the idea and what made me uh, pursue this weird project. And uh, yeah, the, 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 the name is telling. It's zeal and ardor, like Z and A, but it's basically like... Um, uh, the same meaning? Yeah, it was like something enthusiasm or being enthusiastic about the thing you're doing, I think is what I had read. Yeah. So it's one of those that, like, I don't know if anyone's, like I said, gone down that road, but it's for me one when I look up stuff, I'm like, okay, like, let's take in all the information you've given me and try to see if there's something a bigger scale that you're you're going for because I feel like it's easy just to shortchange it and be like, oh, cool, devil music. Sure, yeah. I mean, it, and if you do, fine. Yeah. Like, it, I'm kind of, uh, I get, I wouldn't say manic, but I, I get really involved in stuff I enjoy, and I, I like to see and dig and find interesting stuff. And for people who enjoy the same, I, I hit those dumb things. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, I, I kind of wanted to... I mean, with this, this Lords of Chaos movie coming out, and recently, I don't remember the band... I don't really want to give too much credence to what they did, but, like, you know, with... Have you ever been worried about being unfairly judged based on the content of what you want to make for your art? I mean, I wouldn't say unfairly. I mean, I know full and well what I'm doing. And that being said, like, sat Satanism and satanic imagery does not really pack any weight anymore. Like, this has been done and done <laughs> yeah. well prior to my existence. I guess it's been interesting seeing, like, uh, now I think officially in the United States, we have officially, I just said that already, um, accepted uh, Satanism as a organized form of religion. And having, I think we have a couple of churches. I know, like, in Detroit, because uh, I'm from Michigan, uh, we had the, the Baphomet statue that got erected and stuff. And seeing, yeah, and seeing, like, what controversy it's caused. And so it's like, you know, as someone who is finding ways to make your own art from those inspiration and those sources, it just kind of makes me wonder if you've experienced any of that backlash as well. No. Um, also, we're from Switzerland, and that's a fairly secular part of the world, so they don't tend not to give a shit. But, yeah, as I said, I think uh, we're not on the, on the radar. Like, people wouldn't really go heckle our stuff because they just don't know about us. <laughs> so I know, like, you're, you're kind of uh, getting ready to do this upcoming tour with uh, Behemoth, and... It seems like a lot of fans are really wanting that tour to come here to the States. Does, does it feel like, you know, getting to be on something like Sonic Temple, which is, I think, 
one of the bigger rock festivals here, or metal festivals here in the States. Does it, is it nice to feel like, because like I said earlier, it's hard geographically to kind of get over here with visas and, and make money and all that and tour. So does it feel good to like kind of be on some of these tours where bands are like, fuck, I wish that was coming here and kind of maybe labels and people are going to look at that and go like, okay, like maybe we need to like bring you guys all like this package here and kind of do an American leg or something. It is enticing, but I mean, primarily just like that we, we can do this. We really like Behemoth's music and we believe that the, the, the lineup is nice. That's actually everything that matters. If people want to book us, sure, we're not going to be angry about it, but that's not the, the goal. What has been the most surprising thing about your career so far? Of the tour? Of the, your career. Of, that it happened? <laughs> <laughs> is there a moment like where... Because something I've been finding fun to ask is because it's... You know, when you're so immersed in it, you maybe don't see it, the thing when it's happening. But I always love asking, and kind of my last question is, has there been a moment where you're like, holy shit, this thing is like, it's, it's happening. Like, there's something happening here with this, what I'm doing. Have you had that moment yet? Uh, yeah, I, that was like pretty much in the early stages, but when Rolling Stone wrote about it, and that's what, like, I just put out like an EP shittily on, on Bandcamp. Right. That was the moment where I thought, this is, this is far more attention than this is than necessary. <laughs> and yeah, we took it from there. Other than the Behemoth Tour, what does the rest of 2019 hold for you? Um, just a lot of festivals in Europe and a couple of club shows. We're, I think we might be going to Brazil, okay. but that's wow, uh, kind of hush-hush, so... <laughs> <laughs> and lastly, who are you looking forward to seeing uh, at this festival? Um, I've never seen System of a Down live. That ought to be good. Um, the Fever are playing at the same time as us, which is kind of dumb. And uh, never seen Ghost. That might be silly, but might be fun. This is, I feel like, a, a way to maybe uh, have bands come and see you, and maybe we'll start seeing some interesting... Uh, uh, opening opportunities for you touring wise I would not mind that <laughs> awesome well thank you very much for your time and uh, look forward to seeing your set tonight uh, so I had the pleasure of talking with uh, with Ryan and with Griffin uh, of Shapes what's up and uh, yeah that uh, acoustic set was pretty interesting yeah someone got married well engaged at the end of it yeah I, uh, I don't think I have seen I mean I know you guys did one for Loudwire pretty recently yeah yeah but other than that that's the Second, maybe third time you've done an acoustic set thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We we don't. We've, we've only done them at these festivals. We did them at these thing. three yeah, festivals yeah. and then practice it once in a toilet in Tennessee, and that's it. How long did it take to kind of get an idea of how to reimagine those songs for an acoustic? Maybe twenty minutes. In a, yeah. yeah, literally in a toilet. It was fucking so hot in there, so we just wanted to get out. Stank as shit as well. Mops yeah. everywhere and that. So I've been I've been like jamming them. We've got like an acoustic guitar in the van. And I've been kind of jamming them at the back, but when you were sort of sat in a van, oh, like I was this, looking at your quarter range, so I was like, "That looks really rough." <laughs> <laughs> like as far as like trying to actually get the chord oh, shapes yeah, going. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, it was. It's like um, you, you said. It's kind of like relearning your songs in a different language yeah, in, in a way. Translate because different tunings, different. Um, well, I was trying to think. You guys, you use seven string, don't you? Well, no, we actually. Or it's, use baritone. It's kind of yeah. I use a baritone for the. For Afterlife and Callous Hands, they're like tuned a bit like a seven string with a, a string missing, basically. Yeah. Kind of nicked it off of six. Yeah, it seemed like you guys were having issues tuning the uh, low low string. Yeah. Like, kind of like, is it's, it there? It, you have to do it by ear. Cause yeah. It's like the, the tuners just don't quite get it right. <laughs> so it, there's always a panic. Me and you just sort of go, yeah, yeah, all right. And, and Harry just starts no matter what. Yeah. yeah. There's been a couple of occasions where it'll go and it'll be like, yeah. Oh, yeah. You kind of just gotta do it by ear as you play him. So. Seems like you uh, you've had like a rough like week or so, like losing a bunch of shit. It seemed like on uh, Twitter you. Had oh, posted. mate, it's fucking the <laughs> worst. Got your laptop back. That's good. Got my laptop back. Oh. Sixty dollars. Got it shipped Wait, to Pennsylvania. Did... Oh, because you had left it somewhere. And I had left it somewhere. Oh, okay. I called right. up. Oh man, it's just, touring is great. I love it. But for fuck, losing shit, it's always your favorite stuff yeah. as well. It's always your favorite t-shirt. You leave hanging on like a fucking radiator in Berlin or something. Like. Do you, uh, I don't, I don't know, I don't know if Dane Cook ever made it as far, like, over to you guys across, like, overseas. But there was, like, a thing where he used to be like, oh, the joke was like, 
everyone knows you don't wear your set or you don't wear your favorite shirt to do like a B and E, like a breaking and entering. You wear your second favorite shirt. So it's always one of those that like whenever I see people like get shit ruined at something, it's like, come on, man, like wear something that you like, but it's not your favorite thing because chances are it's going to get fucking ruined or you're going to yeah. lose it. I mean, I've only got one laptop, so it's kind of my favorite <laughs> yeah, laptop. Yeah. Well, but, you don't have a second favorite laptop, yeah, you're telling me? Yeah. I, d I did actually bring two toothbrushes, otherwise I would have lost that as well. I'm, I, I bought my favorite toothpaste from the UK. Yeah, my I favorite lost, bank card, the only fucking yeah. one I have. I lost my bank you said, card. Oh, sorry. Lost, lost his bank card. Got it's a replacement. You've got this stupid system where you give the card over, then they give it back to you in those little fucking folders, and then you like you sign it and then I close it, and I just I don't do that. I pay on the card and I put the card in my pocket at home. I guess that's something I've not really ever thought of. Like I know for the first time, and this isn't like, oh my god, you're so cool because you got to do this, but it's like I got to go to Canada for the first time, living in Michigan, and exchanging money was interesting because it's completely different than American money. But I didn't even think about the fact of like. You guys coming over here, like, I would assume there's a banned bank account or something? Like, yeah, like yeah. trying to think of how you guys get money other than your per diems every day. Like, I didn't even think about that of, like, you might be fucked because, like, maybe there's not a whatever bank you use back home oh, over yeah, here. No. But, uh, no, sorry, I have to say, before, Yusef lost his bank card, ordered a new one, sent it to, like, fucking wherever we were three weeks later. It was, like, on the other side of the country. Gets it, had it for, like, two days and fucking lost it again. <laughs> so did I. I lost my bank card the same day, so... I've been a mess. I think everyone's lost a bank card except for Harry, who's the one that always loses his wallet normally. He lost three wallets on one tour. <laughs> but this tour, he's not Loves lost it. it. He actually got one of those little GPS trackers for his wallet. Has he got one? Yeah, yeah, he yeah. got one. I don't know if it's on or anything, but yeah. He... Do those work? Like, I, I, because my wife's almost very much the same way, like, loses her debit card, loses I, everything. I'm not like this, Norman. I've never done this shit <laughs> in my touring, life. It's touring, though. It's touring. Tour. Three checking three in and out. I've got three <laughs> bags checking in and out of hotel rooms every day. Van, venue, all this shit, and it's just yeah. constantly like juggling your shit. And also like stage clothes and being drunk and like daytime clothes. Well. It's it's confusing. Yeah. I'm glad you actually brought up the drinking thing. Uh, we are we're called brutally speaking BREW. Talk about uh, craft cocktails, spirits, beers, coffees, all that kind of stuff. Lovely. I just saw a press release that your dad released a sake lager infused lager. Dude, it is incredible. Is it? What like, the fuck does that taste like? It um it kind of like a. Uh, Kind of like a sh like a shandy, like you know, like okay. a, like a lemonade top. Um, Have you but, had it? No, I just went for a little sip of my beer off. Camera, yeah, yeah. You know, I think it's a wide angle. Yeah, it's a wide angle. Yeah, dude, that is like I'm not I'm not a big uh, I'm not a big like uh, like beery beer kind of drinker. Like the ales and stuff, I can't drink that. Uh, I mean, I can, but I don't really like like it. I can't um, like lager IPA, but that thing that um, I can't remember what it's called, but it's fucking great. I had a couple couple bottles of that at home so yeah it was session. just like as i read that i was like like because you know we're in this interesting time period now where i feel like musically and with with a lot of things things are being no pun intended but infused with other elements of all these other things you look at a band like uh, zeal and ardor for example infusing you know like african-american spiritual hymnal type songs with like black metal and shit like that and you're like is that what they do yeah kind of we're sharing a dressing room with them they love stretching we walked in this morning. Oh, yeah. They're just doing a stretching. workout. Yeah, yeah. Walk, walk out of the room, stretching. Hour I'm later, come back, there, like, still stretching. I was like, "Yo, come on, couple more reps." Like, you're, gonna fucking, <laughs> you're gonna fucking snap in a minute, lads. But it's uh, it's one of those things where it's it's just been interesting to kind of see a lot of ways that people are taking like heavy music and kind of going way out there with it, like you know, like a band like Meshuggah, or even going back like more old school with like a band like Ghost, who's kind of going more Blue Oyster Cultish or whatever, and seeing just where everyone takes things and infusing their own flavor to it. In addition now to like beers where it's like having traveled around the US quite a bit recently, it's like I'm seeing like the different stamp places people are putting on it, like going to Buffalo and finding out that they have to use all local ingredients uh, in their beer making process right, yeah, to kind yeah. of support local and so forth. Um, so it's just kind of interesting to, you know, a fucking sake infused lager. It's like, what yeah. the fuck is that? Yeah, yeah. Um... I know he's got a mate in Japan who runs like one of the biggest sake factories out there. We drink a lot of sake, but yeah, that, that, um, it's great. I would really recommend trying it. What, uh, you know, getting the opportunity to travel the States and abroad in general, what do you notice that's different in uh, beer drinking from, or spirits and everything else, like from like overseas to here in the States? Uh, I mean, drinking beers over here is, uh, there's a lot of shit beers. But there's also, there's a lot of really good beers. Like, there's kind of like no middle ground. Like, you go into any pub in the UK and there'll be like one Carling, which is like the worst of the worst. I'd never touch it. Carlsberg is kind of like your Bud Light. It's kind of just piss water. But then you get up to like, 
you got like Stella. your Stellas, your Cronenbergs. Sam Miguel. Like this, Sam Miguel. There's like a strong middle ground of like big Peroni. brand, com- big brand like, companies. Yeah. It's a nice beer. Like you drink it on a, on, like you, it's respectable to drink it. And then day, you have all your IPAs and stuff and all your hipster stuff. But over here, you've got like shit or fantastic. Yeah, there's, there's, there's been no some ground. great beers here though. I, I think what I had in my sort in my brain of what I thought was gonna what it was gonna be like was just like Bud Light, Coors Light, Miller Light, and those are everywhere. But also, you can go in any bar and get like great beer if you yeah, want yeah. to. I'm trying not to drink beer anyway. He says yeah. with a beer on. Yeah, off we, camera, we've been avoiding the beer because for like if you drink beer every day for two months. Turns a fat piece of shit, yeah. yeah it's so just, Jameson is the weapon yeah. of choice. Yeah, so I got so fooled by whiskey. Jameson recently because they put out this like cask mates uh, something or other, and it had IPA something. And I thought it was a beer. I thought it was like a Jameson infused beer, and I got it. And then the person brought me a shot, and I was like, oh, "There you go." What the fuck is this? And they're like, "Well, no, it's Jameson in like an IPA barrel or something." <laughs> I was like, "Oh," uh, and I kind of want to be like, "Well, I don't want that." It's like a, getting a cupcake in a pizza box. You're like, "It's still a cupcake, right?" Okay, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, something we uh, kind of talk about and kind of slowly and wrapping up because I know I have you for a short time. You know, you guys have put out the record and it came out in November. So, I mean, it's still relatively new. But it seems like, you know, the world is kind of fickle when it comes to releasing music and so forth. And something I kind of like to ask just to kind of get an idea of where everything is from your perspective. Do you feel like dropping singles or EPs is a better way to go to keep fans interested versus I'm, putting out full lengths? I think, I think it's, a, it's a debatable thing, really, because if you, have, if you have the social media following, then absolutely singles is a better way to do it. It's product rollout. You can keep people interested. That's what all the rappers are doing. But they all have massive social media followings. For a band like us, where it's not a, a huge amount. We need print media, we need like online press, and we need all that kind of coverage to really push our product out there. We're not big enough yet to kind of survive by ourselves doing singles. And the problem is, is play, big media don't give you the coverage unless it's an album, unless you have something to push and there's a story behind or a fucking concept or whatever. They won't just push a single. They might retweet it, but that's about it. What is in store for you guys the rest of 2019? We go back home in two days and then have like three days off and then go back out with uh, a Slam Dunk Fest, I think it's Slam Dunk Festival. Yep. Got a show of Bullet for, uh, from Valentine as well. And then just like every weekend after that, we've got shows and stuff. So in between, we're trying to write basically, you know. The thing is, you've you got to be quick as fuck, but I kind of like like the little, like almost like gardening leave after, after writing an album where you just go, I don't want to write any music. I want to fucking st- store up whatever's in me. I don't want to this album to sound the same I want to change shit and I want to figure out what I want to change um, it you takes a couple be, months yeah, feeling the same things you were feeling right in the first yeah, album yeah. or the, the, the previous album because you might just write the same lyrics basically yeah exactly and lastly if there was a shapes beer or a cocktail or a spirit of some kind what would it taste like fuck it. <laughs> <laughs> just slap your, your band logo like a, like a Davis scotch label. like a nice, yeah. a nice a nice either a nice Irish or a nice scotch whiskey with sort of like like a sweet overtone, but a hearty peach. I think it probably tastes like a Long Island iced tea because we do loads of we do loads of different shit. So you basically just take every bit of booze on the shelf, whack it in a glass, and put a little fucking cherry cocktail or umbrella or in there, yeah. and it would be called the murder weapon. Yeah. <laughs> well, thank you very much for taking the time to us. No worries. Talk to us, and uh, it was really great catching you guys' set today twice, actually. There you go. Uh, so hopefully, uh, see you guys back in the states sometime in the next year. Yeah, man, absolutely. Thanks for having thank us. Thank you. So that was my conversation uh, with Manuel from Zeal and Arter, Joel from Kill Switch and Gage, Griffin and Ryan from Shapes, Britton and Cody from Wage War, and Kyle from Bad Wolves. Dan couldn't be there, but, uh, you know, I, I kind of felt, I kind of prefaced and said that, A, the audio was a little rough. Uh, I did the best I could. Secondly, though, there were a couple where either I felt like I was talking too much uh, but you know, like I said, you're, you're thrown into the middle of something and trying to make something happen in such a, a not normal amount of time when you do something like this. Uh, so you're just trying to make the best of it. And, you know, in some instances, like with Joel, like it was funny, I had texted his brother, which obviously I talked a lot about his brother being a mutual, uh, thing we had in common. But the funny thing is, is like, I was like, Oh God, I, uh, I don't know that like your brother was like, your brother doesn't talk a whole lot. Like I had asked him a question. He's like, yeah, you know, that's cool. Uh, blah, blah, blah. And then he goes, well, I mean, that's just kind of how he is. Like, you know, I texted him after the fact and you know, like he said, it was good and all this kind of other stuff, like no need to worry about it. And I was like, oh, and the publicist even reiterated that too. But it was just one of those, like where I walked away from that, I was like, God, I wasted that opportunity. <laughs> uh, that wasn't too bad. 
Well, I guess I've done worse. Yeah, you're fine. I can think of I can think of episodes that have never been published before. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, the Wage War one was kind of fun too. Uh I didn't that was funny. I had been told I was getting a couple of different people and then they sat me with two people after I was told I was getting one and it wasn't any <laughs> It was just one of those where I was like, I'm not even going to try to prepare for this anymore. <laughs> right. This would have been yeah. the Dan Terry uh, experience here where he just was like, okay, you're giving me somebody? All right, let's just go. <laughs> let's just see what happens. Yeah. Yeah, it, it was one of those I was very happy and glad that uh, I've had you to bounce some uh, interviews that we've done off of before where I can just go like, okay, something can happen if you're just willing to be present in the moment and listen and, and just go. And it was hard not to over prepare like I, I realize like it's you really can't i mean if that if i learned anything from this festival other than the fact of like you know just seeing how hard everyone works and a lot of like you know there were shows that were more web-based you know with like camera like nice cameras and they had like scripts ready for people so like they could do you know the promos at the end like hey i'm so and so and you've been rocked listening to rock shock blah 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 like you know they had like scripts ready for everybody and you know like professional lighting and like all this kind of stuff and it was just you know wild to see how everyone does what they do and at first like you know i think i, I made a comment before you know it was kind of intimidating to be like this little you know diy you know ho-hum like oh here i am just this thing no one's ever heard of and you know literally being right next to iHeartRadio, and i'm like oh my god i don't belong here <laughs> yeah that's pretty cool though to see some of the some of the bigger outlets though because they're they're kind of a confirmation yeah yeah i guess it's i you know and honestly like and I'm, I'm just gonna say it because i think i think we do better interviews than those outlets do i think they're more geared for what that was whereas you're probably right about that you're probably right about that, but as far as the week to week, I think that I think the deep dive, long form interviews are the future. Yeah, and they're what fans of these artists actually want. So I think in a case like that, I think um, really in a lot of ways, it's 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 a confirmation of yeah, I'm I'm up here with these guys, but you know, in ten years, what I'm doing is probably going to be the norm, and you know, they're going to be all like, oh my god, I can't believe I was sitting right next to brutally speaking already. <laughs> <laughs> yeah like no one no one's gonna say that uh speaking of you know feedback or whatever i actually did wanna, i might say that i did want to say this though um we got a we got some feedback on our land and tours youtube episode and by the way uh it, it might take me a, a little bit to get all the interviews i did all these have videos other than wage war um it might take me a minute to sync up the audio with the, the visual and all that kind of stuff, but be on the lookout for that over on our YouTube. We will have those up uh, soon. But we ended up getting this uh, comment from Scott English a couple of days ago on our Land and Tours episode. And, you know, we don't receive a lot of information like this or a lot of feedback, so I just kind of wanted to share it uh, because I it made me feel good. Um, it says, got to be super honest, which as soon as I saw that, I was like, oh, fuck. Um yeah, and it goes, you ask the best intellectual questions that, at least for me as a fan in the same age area as you, I'd want to hear from Landon. Dude is super smart and puts out some very heavy lyrics. And then, you know, I just kind of commented, like, hey, thanks for, you know, sending us that. We don't really hear a whole lot of stuff and, you know, whatever. I'm kind of my own worst enemy when it comes to, like, am I talking too much or not at all or whatever. And he goes, yeah, I'm sure it's a slippery slope, but no, I think you knocked it out of the park. And you kept him talking the whole time. He didn't shut down. And you didn't ask him anything that turned the vibe of it at all. Longest interview podcast I've watched in a minute. Good shit. Nice. So That's we, awesome. We appreciate those kind of things. Like I said, we, we don't get a ton of feedback, uh, which may or may not come as a surprise. But uh, if you have any criticism or any thoughts on anything we're doing, like we'd like to hear it. Absolutely. I mean... You guys can tell John about how intellectual he's being while I'm over here being like, are you sure you're not actually saying fapping on this song? <laughs> hey, but you know what? I did see in one of those Norma Jean things, because I've seen that thing, that episode still getting shared. Uh, I did see that someone was like, hey, he said uh, in St. Louis he would say fapping around or whatever. Yeah, yeah. So, I'm, I mean, I'm excited about that for sure. <laughs> I'm excited about Corey, Corey Brandon coming around and fapping in my town. Absolutely. What a... What other reason is there to be alive? <laughs> Look out for that new band, Norma Skeet. Absolutely. Coming to a town near you. Uh, but with all that being said, uh, I will share my, uh, I will save my Atlanta story, a very wild story, uh, I think for the Craig Gas episode, because it seems like it'll be a very on-par story with some of the stuff that we had talked about in that. Um, 
So this was kind of a more or less day one for me for uh, Sonic Temple Festival. Uh, we had two more interviews, but they're going to be longer. They're going to be with Amy, who is uh, one of the publicists that we deal with uh, constantly. Uh, you know, she's the one that kind of helps us get like you know Phil from All the Remains and a lot of these other bigger bands. And uh, the other one I did with Craig Gas. Um, that one is a fucking roller coaster. Uh, a lot of people were like, oh, he won't let you talk edgewise. So I feel like I kind of went into it being like, okay, like I'm going to get my shit in. And I think it's funny. Like I had him laughing, whether it's fake or not, I don't know. But I had him laughing. He told some really interesting stories. We talked about sex in the city. He tells a funny Tracy Morgan story. It's just, uh, it's a good fucking time. And I'm looking forward to getting those two episodes out. Very diverse uh, it, interviews, conversations, whatever. Um, and this is typically where we would plug all the band's socials, but you know what? There are so fucking many between Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, so we're just going to throw them all in the show notes. Uh, so if you would like to keep up with Metal Nexus, you can find Metal Nexus at MetalNexus.net, Facebook at Metal Nexus, Instagram at Metal.Nexus, and Twitter at Metal underscore Nexus. Dan, where can people find you? Well, you can absolutely find me on Twitter at Discuss Metal Dan. You can send me an email at DiscussMetalDan at gmail.com. Uh, you can find out information about my other podcast, Discography Discussion, at DiscussMetal.com. So there's all kinds of ways you can get a hold of me. And if you would like to keep up with everything this podcast, you can find us simply enough on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at BrewSpeakPod, YouTube at Brutally Speaking Podcast. And if you would like to email us, you can find us at BrutallySpeaking at gmail.com. And for the Brutally Speaking Podcast, I am John. And I am Dan. And we will talk to you all next time.